Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome you for this year's Lindbergh Award Lecture. Our 2021 Lindbergh Awardee, as you know, is Professor John Meyer from the Department of Psychology. An outstanding teacher scholar, Dr. Mayer is highly deserving of this distinguished recognition. Professor Mayer, who joined the UNH faculty in 1989, is a highly acclaimed, prolific researcher in personality psychology. He is internationally renowned for his pioneering and impactful work in the framing and understanding of emotional intelligence. And whether he likes it or not, the term he coined has become part of the popular vernacular. Professor Mayer and his colleagues developed a widely used test that measures emotional intelligence and that has been empirically shown to predict effective functioning across many domains of everyday life. Professor Mayer also developed and refined the construct of personal intelligence, another well-used test which is reliable and valid using large populations. For those of you not familiar with academic psychology, the construction and validation of new tests and measures entails a complicated and tedious multi-tiered process, both theoretically and empirically. Professor Mayer's extensive body of published work includes five authored or co-authored books, including a foundational textbook in personality psychology, three additional edited volumes, scores of chapters, and more than 125 peer-reviewed articles. When I checked yesterday, according to Google Scholar, Professor Mayer has 105,929 citations. Among his awards, Professor Mayer has won the Excellence in Research Award from UNH, several Research Excellence Awards from the Mensa Foundation and the Research, sorry, from the Mensa Education and Research Foundation, and has been elected a fellow of the American Psychological Society. Professor Mayer's work as a mentor and teacher is no less impressive. He has mentored 17 masters and doctoral students, several of whom have gone on to careers in academia. It's noteworthy that six of the 20 papers he published just in the last five years included graduate students as co-authors. His undergraduate courses are first rate. Students consistently note that they are impressed by his mastery of the material, as well as his engagement, eloquence, and joviality. Professor Mayer has demonstrated that he possesses the highest qualities of scholarship and teaching, and is most deserving of the Lindbergh Award. We are honored to have him as our colleague. Please join me in congratulating Professor Mayer. So Professor Mayer will speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have questions, Q&A time, and discussion. So thank, thank you, you so Professor much. Mayer. That was a, a lovely introduction, and I'm very appreciative. Thank you. We're delighted to have you here. Um, would it be better if we cut the lights so you can see the screen a little bit more readily? Yes, OK. Oh, thank you very much. We're OK? Yes. OK. And uh, can you hear me? Can you all hear me OK? No, OK. Your microphone is muted. Ah, my microphone is muted. That's probably why. How's this? Cool. Great. I tried to put the microphone under my mask. But that leads to a lot of heavy breathing, so I think this may be better. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, let's see. Oh, that's interesting. Here we go. But why not this? There we go. OK. Uh, this is how I look without my mask. I'm only slightly photoshopped. Um, I, I usually ask the photographer to make me look like Justin Bieber. But I think the photographer is a little conservative in his editing. Um, I, I want to thank the College of Liberal Arts and the Psychology Department both uh, for their support. Uh, I know that uh, Dean Dillon and Susan Dume and Amanda Ouellette have worked really hard behind the scenes to uh, put this together, especially so, as you all may imagine, uh, in these COVID times. And on the other side, I want to thank uh, Bill Stein, the chair of the psychology department, our psychology faculty, and our whole department there um, for all of their support, without which uh, my work would not be possible. 
Um, thanks also to my current and former lab members, only the current members uh, for the most part are shown here who informed and contributed to this work. And incidentally, they were kind enough to take a look, an advanced look at this talk to make sure that, that uh, uh, it, it went okay. Um, and thanks, thanks also to my collaborators and lab members who appear in this talk, and you'll see pictures of them as I go along. Uh, President Peter Salovey of Yale University, uh, David Caruso, Abigail Panter. Uh, well, you'll see them as I go along, so I will uh, wait till we see their works. So uh, a few words about my purpose. Intelligences are powerful variables that predict such things as educational attainment five years in advance at very high levels. Um, they predict academic achievement overall, the number of years in school and the degrees earned. And they predict occupational success as well. Um, intelligences are influenced by biology and the environment. Uh, Meta-analyses presently put the genetic estimate at about 50%. Uh, but there are also illnesses and environmental toxins that reduce IQ, so intelligence is very important to measure as a public health matter. And our most recent estimates are that each year of schooling raises a person's IQ between about two to five IQ points, and that's gonna be my focus uh, 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 indirectly. I will uh, uh, address that today. I think the five points seems a bit outrageous to me, but the uh, two points seems reasonable. And I kid around with my, the students in my classes that simply by taking my class, I'm raising their IQ 0.25 points. Um, my aims are to identify overlooked human intelligences so as to more fully represent human capacities, uh, to measure them fairly, ensuring diversity in item content and removing biased test items and to understand the impact of these intelligences on people's lives, so as to help people know what they're good at and where education might improve their performance if they want to improve. All right, so the title of my talk has to do with the liberal arts, because in a way, that's where a lot of this got started. Um, that's uh, where I went to school, it's called the East Quad, or the Residential College of the University of Michigan. And when I went to that college, it was mostly sort of a counterculture type of place, although since then it's been converted into an honors college, but so far as I can tell, there's not much difference. Um, as an undergrad, I was a creative writing and uh, major and also in dramatic theory and criticism. It's a double major. So I was, in the liberal, I was in the humanities part of the liberal arts. Um, but I had issues living in the residential college. I experienced a little bit too much drama with the drama students, and I felt uncomfortably competitive with the creative writing students. And so I left, uh, not academically, but residentially. As soon as I was allowed, I moved to the suburbs, so to speak, to, a north, to a, what the University of Michigan refers to as their North Campus, um, and lived up there, surrounded by engineers and nursing students and a few quieter liberal arts people. Um, and uh, you can see, actually, I think some of these are contemporary pictures, that this is pretty spread out and low key, relatively speaking. I lived in a place like that. So we sat around a lot talking in the dining room, and uh, the engineers were rather vocal about all the things they were learning. Probably they should have been. This is uh, one of our uh, housemates, Bill Joy, who is actually the founder and chief scientist of Sun Microsystems, and is one of my friends of the time, uh, repeated, <laughs> like he always says his name and says, he's worth billions of dollars, you know. <laughs> Um, but he was one of the engineers there, and there were uh, other engineers and chemists and so forth. And they said, you know, we learn really important stuff. And one day they turned to me, uh, and they said, come on, Mayor, what are you learning in your creative writing and drama majors anyway? So somehow I had an answer for that. I don't know where it came from, 
probably from my professors. But my own answer was that plots move us from one mental state to another, they alter our emotions, and there is a logic in them about how people operate. Now, I say probably this came from my professors because it turns out this is not a new idea. Uh, it's been circulating around uh, in the liberal arts for a number of years, and in fact, R.S. Crane of the Chicago School of Criticism, I later learned, wrote that a novel's plot imitates in words a sequence of human activities with a power to affect our opinions and emotions in a certain way, and that the best plots allow readers to evaluate ethics and actions and thought vis-a-vis -vis the human situations in which they are in engaged. Okay so far? Can all hear me all right? Great. Okay, so fast forwarding a bit, because uh, we don't want to stay in the past today, I don't think. Um, 18 years later. In 18 years later, unbeknownst to me actually at the time, a mo new model of intelligence was introduced, uh, which was extremely important, uh, and I won't go into the reasons why today, but it was very, very uh, unifying and uh, useful in the field. It was called the three stratum model or the cattell horn carroll model. Uh, the first, so as you might imagine, there are three strata to this. Uh, stratum one is just sort of the individual tasks that people fill out in intelligence scales. Stratum two are now what's called broad intelligences. And these are a set of intelligences that incorporate groups of specific tasks. So for example, virtual, verbal, ah, sorry, visual spatial intelligence divides into tasks involving understanding spatial relations and picture information. And then finally, uh, general intelligence sits at the top rather like a CEO. Um, and if, for those of you who are unfamiliar with intelligence testing, you know this might be a specific test of spatial, well, it might be, it is a specific test of spatial ability. If you fold up that piece of paper, which block will it look like? Um, perceptual ability, uh, this is all visual, these two are visual spatial intelligence, is uh, if you put these puzzle pieces together, what, uh, can you put these puzzle pieces together? And then word fluency, tell me what rhymes with house. Notice that the intelligences of the three stratum model concern what I refer to as things. Uh, visual spatial sometimes is described as orienting objects in space. Quantitative thinking is uh, numbers, concerns numbers. Fluid intelligence involves the capacity to process visual patterns. Um, we get a little bit more toward uh, a people end with things like comprehension knowledge, which is knowing um, how, what words mean, being able to reason with words, and reading and writing. But there's nothing specifically focused on you or I. And the problem is that the three stratum model didn't seem to describe either abilities relating to understanding the people around us, the personalities around us, or our own personalities. But we can't help but watch and think about people. We're evolutionarily wired to do so. We can't help but wonder about the people we see. We watch people wherever they are. In the social brain hypothesis, Ian Dunbar argues that the key problems of humanity are solved at the social level. For mammals and other species, larger brains allow for larger, more sophisticated social organizations. And a larger brain enables people to track one another through discussions and observations. I refer to the discussion as gossiping about one another. Um, all right. so. As I said, that model was unbeknownst to us. Uh, when I say us here, I'm referring to uh, Peter Salovey here on the left and myself many uh, uh, versions earlier. Um, and here we are in 1988 working on a pre-publication draft 
of an article that was going to be called Emotional Intelligence. And uh, as I like to kid around, uh, you can tell that Peter Salovey is going to become the president of Yale, even at this early stage, because he's the only one on the beach, this was in uh, North Carolina, on the beach in the summer, who's wearing long pants. So uh, we published two articles in 1990 on emotional intelligence, which were uh, resoundingly ignored. And then in 1995, uh, the journalist Daniel Goleman popularized our theory uh, in an account in a book. And it, lo and behold, it made the cover of uh, Time magazine. And emotional intelligence uh, was, uh, was defined in some of that writing as something like persistence, zeal, optimism, self-control, and character. That's not exactly what we had been writing about. Our actual definition was that it was the capacity to reason accurately about emotion and emotional information and to use that information in one's life. Fast forward again, 2008. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, to uh, be living at a time when a great deal was being learned about per human personality, and I could start to see, finally, uh, what I had been hoping was another intelligence uh, becoming tractable to measure, which is personal intelligence, an intelligence about personality in oneself and other people. But then I had a problem. It was kind of uh, inelegant to have introduced a theory of emotional intelligence, and then a number of years later, a theory of personal intelligence. How did they relate? How did they go together? And then, of course, well, not of course, but then for those who are familiar with the field, a number of years earlier, in 1920, uh, Thorndike had introduced the idea of a social intelligence. So all of a sudden, where before there were no intelligences concerned with people, now there were three. And so recent, more recently still, I've suggested that there are people-centered intelligences, a group of people-centered intelligences. Um, in 2014, uh, my colleagues Carolyn McCann and Richard Roberts and a number of other eminent researchers uh, were, for, were succeeded in obtaining funding to test 800 people who took two days worth of intelligence tests. Uh, this was funded by the Army Research Institute at ETS. Um, and in doing so, they were able to definitively demonstrate that emotional intelligence, as measured by one of the ability scales that we've developed, is uh, a, a broad intelligence. More recently, I've been, ad I've been arguing that there is this dimension of thing versus people-focused broad intelligences. So over here, we have kind of the original in uh, intelligences of the three stratum model. In the middle are mixed intelligences, and to the right are these people-centered intelligences. So next I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we test this, and then I'm going to return to some issues that get a little closer to the liberal arts. Um, here are two examples of our measure, measures. Uh, the Mesquite Emotional Intelligence Test, uh, and forthcoming is a Mesquite II. Um, and the test of personal intelligence. And my colleagues who work on these with me are uh, Peter Salove and David Caruso on the Mesquite, and Abigail Panter and David Caruso on uh, the TOPI, or test of personal intelligence. Here's an, uh, for the Mesquite II, test items are reviewed by an expert panel who refer to research on emotions to evaluate which choices are correct. And the test is scored according to how well a respondent chooses the correct answers. I'm going to show you a couple of items. If you don't get them, don't worry, because each individual item 
lacks a, a much reliability. It's only when you aggregate them that you get a reliable score. Um, so here's a sample visual item. A woman's visiting the doctor. He says, your medical checkup revealed some irregularities. I recommend we do more medical tests. And the woman calls her best friend to discuss the situation. Question is, what could the friend say to make the woman feel least frightened? Try not to think about it. You can't control it, so you'll just have to wait. Uh, second alternative, nothing's definite yet. Let's wait for more information. Want to have lunch at that new restaurant? Third, how did that conversation with your doctor make you feel? And fourth, I can understand you're worried, but this is very common. My sister had to have more tests done. Uh, dare I ask for an answer? If, these, if this is A, B, C, and D, what do you say? Just call it out. Is there no all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> There's no all of the above. B. B, OK. Here's what the expert panel said. They liked B. That was a one-point answer. Um, reasoned, and I'm inferring the reason that they said that, because distraction um, makes sense that is eating at the new restaurant, because nothing can be done about it now. But they liked number four even better. I can understand that you're worried, uh, but this is very common. My sister had to have more tests done. So that's a two-point response there. Like I said, if you get it wrong, don't worry about it. Or I guess half right, don't worry about it. Um, here's an item from personal intelligence. Notice there's nothing in here about emotion. It's all about personality things. Uh, Ned's boss, Alan, is highly conscientious and orderly. When Alan finds out that Ned was late for work, Alan likely, A, won't care. B, he will at a minimum make a note of it and may be disturbed by it. C, greet Ned enthusiastically. Or D, feel distressed and anxious. What do you say here? Just call it out. B, and in this case, you're right on target. If I do this with a large audience, uh, with either emotional intelligence or personal intelligence, uh, what you discover is that there are a lot of people who get them all, and I go through a bunch of these, which I'm not doing here today. There are a bunch of people who get it all right, and then a bunch of people who have what I refer to as social courage, who <laughs> persistently raise their hands and get them wrong. And um, it's really quite uh, striking. If a person is out, let's do one more. If a person is outgoing and talkative, most likely she also is inclined to be A, self-controlled, B, willing to take more risks than average, C, anxious and impulsive, and D, fairly thick-skinned. What do you say? B, B it is again. Yes, okay. So that's how these tests look and work. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about key findings, uh, but one of the things that I've had fun with the last few years is um, there are a lot of other tests of emotional intelligence where people are, asked, people are asked to report on their own personal intelligence, or emotional intelligence, in this case. Um, so for example, here's a, a scale I just pulled off the web, but it's like a dozen other scales, some of which are commercially available. I manage anxiety, stress, anger, and fear in pursuit of a goal. You can strongly agree and strongly disagree. Um, or I can stay calm under pressure, strongly agree to disagree. Um, I took this test. As you see, I got a good EQ. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how high the scale went. Probably good was average. Um, as it turns out that actual intelligence is measured by our scales, and self-estimated intelligences are typically quite discrepant. In meta-analyses across broad intelligences, the actual, the actual correlations between self-estimates and actual intelligence is about uh, 0.29, which is really low for a test-to-test -test correlation. We have to always talk about the class of prediction we're making when we talk about how high or low a, cor a correlation is. Test-to-test -test correlations easily go up to 0.8 and 0.9. So 0.29 is pretty crummy. And the um, figure there on the right just happens to be a recent study that we did that was easily accessible to me. Um, 696 people who've taken an actual ability scale of personal intelligence 
and then judge their ability. And here the correlation is negative 0.05. We're finding mysteriously that the correlation between self-estimates and actual ability seems to be declining. Um, so is there any difference between people who know how uh, smart they are, so to speak? Well, in the high actual ability and high self-estimate group, we have people who tend to be confident, uh, fairly positive emotions, Con but I think the key issues here are that they are conscientious, that is, they're watching themselves and how well they do, and they're open and they're intelligent. Um, underconfident people who are high in actual ability just don't feel good about themselves. Low actual ability and high self-estimates tend to be the, over which we refer to as the overconfident group, are very satisfied, they have high positive affect again, they exhibit enormously high self-deceptive enhancement, as it turns out. Um, and at the extremes, we wonder if they are narcissistic, but we don't know. And then the accurate low are the, uh, I, I feel empathy toward this group. They are lacking in confidence. They believe they're low in intelligence, and they are right. And they are not happy about it. Um, Here's a second study uh, that was just published a couple of weeks ago. This is with Victoria Bryan, who's in the audience somewhere. Um, there she is, the lab members are pointing toward her. Um, and she's really, she's not really, she is the lead author of this study and did uh, an enormous amount of work on it. And this was the first test of whether this thing versus people continuum really exists. And what this graph shows you is that people-centered intelligences correlate more highly amongst themselves at 0.43 um, and least highly with thing-centered intelligences. And in the middle between mixed, what I'm referring to as mixed intelligences, which are uh, verbal comprehension and uh, memory retrieval. Uh, sorry, and reading and writing, which, are, which all involve symbols that can refer to, each, to either things or to people. Um, yeah, just a, a bit here. Uh, very low correlations with the, uh, with the big five personality traits. It does seem that the higher your personal intelligence, sorry, the higher your people-centered intelligence is, the lower your psychiatric symptomatology. Um, and uh, this is particularly true in schizophrenia where NIH uh, put the mesquite in a battery of tests to look at, psych at psychiatric symptoms and schizophrenics, people with schizophrenia have difficulty with these scales. And um, these scales correlate with mental, uh, more highly with mental abilities, other mental abilities. Let me come back to the liberal arts now. Uh, so plots. Plots I mentioned in the beginning uh, and sort of stuttered out to those engineers help us understand how people behave and change their emotions. So do pe personal and emotional intelligences perhaps predict good narratives? In work with Aaron Kenny and Michelle Leishman, who's also here today, I think, is that Michelle? Yes, okay. Um, uh, Erin Kenny went out and interviewed mothers who were high and low in personal intelligence. She gave them one of our short scales of uh, personal intelligence. And let me just go through this for a moment. So the mother high in personal intelligence, this is one of the con recorded conversations. Um, the child, uh, they're asked to talk about two friends and how they're the same or different in this particular episode. The child goes, both my friends kind of want to be cool. They both kind of like, they're both kind of like sassy and mean a little bit, like pushy and stuff. And the mother says, so you would say that they have strong personalities? And the child says, yes, maybe. Bossy, they are bossy. And the mother says, good word, bossy. We could also call that confident. That's a little nicer word. The mother lower in personal intelligence asks, so how are David and Nathan the same? And the child goes, they are different. And the mother says, how are they different? 
And the child says, their hair. Mother says, their hair? The child says, yeah. Anything else about them? Child, no, just different color hair. And the mother says, okay, what can you do? Now here's a very different uh, kind of narrative. Here, uh, Donna Perkins, is Donna Perkins here by any chance? Donna Perkins is here. Hi, Donna. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a low school, uh, Donna Perkins went out and asked adolescents about challenging social situations they had faced. And here's a low scoring adolescent, a 15 year old male, and notice that his verbal IQ is pretty good, 127. His emotional IQ, however, was, down at a, was simply average. Um, how did the situation begin? My friends wanted me to beat the hell out of someone. Personally, violence makes me uncomfortable, but I wasn't a pacifist. I love nature, and I always think about what pain I am causing someone, even if I try not to. How did you handle it? They, referring to his friends, won, but I fought him but sorry, but I fought so that I would never harm him, only piss him off. A little while after that, I became a total pacifist, except for my brothers. And what would have been your parents' reaction? My dad would have beat me. Here's the highest scoring adolescent. Notice her verbal IQ is about the same. Her emotional IQ, though, is far higher. And I should mention in those two stories of the children, those were equated for word, uh, word length. Um, the young woman says, once my friends wanted to sneak into someone's room and paint them while he slept. It began as joking around. Wouldn't this be funny? Could you believe it if? And then slowly it evolved into dares. I bet you wouldn't, or I dare you to. I felt like it was betraying the trust I had with the other person. I didn't feel right with sneaking up on a sleeping person with no way to defend himself. And I thought doing this would make the person have his feelings hurt. I know how little pranks like this could really hurt someone's feelings. How'd you handle it? I told them straight out that it was a degrading thing to do and they shouldn't be so cruel. What would your parents' reaction have been? They would have been proud. And now notice the change in perspective, which is so common to highly uh, abstract thinking. But they might also have said that I ruined a perfectly harmless joke. So uh, I'm just going to mention, as I read these, these are two different kinds of narratives. One is a very sophisticated kind of narrative, and the other less so. And we see this again and again in studies in our laboratory. Um, here's one other study I wanted to show you. Um, this was carried out in, uh, at West Point Military Academy uh, with uh, Bill Skimmyhorn, uh, William Skimmyhorn, who you can see here, who's now at the College of William and Mary, but at that time was a faculty member at West Point. Um, and we had access to all of the uh, cadets, the students' grades in all of their courses across the curriculum. And we calculated their GPA in thing-oriented courses, chemistry, engineering, and physics, and people-centered courses, of which there are not so many at West Point, but we found literature and philosophy and leadership. And notice, here are the correlations with course GPA. For thing-related courses, one broad intelligence, visual-spatial intelligence, predicts pretty well. But personal intelligence does not. But when you move over to people-related courses, Personal intelligence is predicting GPA, but spatial and visual spatial intelligence less so. Now, I've, uh, I've been around long enough to know, hey, that's really interesting, but it's just one study. Even, I mean, it is 1,000, there are uh, 1,100 people here, but it's still just one study. Fortunately, uh, thanks, thanks again to uh, Bill Skimmyhorn, we were able to do this twice. So here it, here it is, this, this was the entire first class, uh, the entire class of a year at West Point. I don't think I'm allowed to tell you which year. Here's the subsequent year. It's the same pattern, which puts a little bit more uh, 
oomph into the finding, I think. A little bit more, we can treat it with a little bit more security. So uh, what does it all mean? Well, there are a lot of different meanings that could be drawn from this, I, I suspect. Um, but let me start back uh, with that question that was posed to me at the, at the uh, dining room table at uh, John Sinclair House. Please don't ask me who John Sinclair was, but that was the name of the house at the co-op I was in. Um, you know, what are you learning in your creative writing and drama majors anyway? We found pretty strong evidence that there exist broad intelligences related to reasoning about people. And that these are more closely related to one another than intelligences about, than intelligences about things. Um, now, one means of teaching about people, I believe, is through narrative. Narratives interweave people-centered issues into complex systems that reflect real-life experiences. One of the things I like about literature and drama is that they somewhat depersonalize the experience of thinking about oneself and allow one's mind to float over other people's experiences and how they think about themselves as kind of simulations of what life might be like. And although they're one step removed from us, they remain of interest because they are like us to some degree, or maybe they're totally unlike us, and they're interesting for that reason. So they allow for a relatively dispassionate analysis of ways to act and to live. So we don't know for sure, but maybe Given that each year of education raises IQ in general, and intelligence divides into broad abilities, including the people-centered, and that liberal arts courses often address understanding people, maybe a liberal arts education strengthens students' capacities to reason about people, raising their people-centered intelligences. Now in this talk, I've focused on reasoning about realistic kinds of characters, but I would like to just add a, a quick coda. What about imagined human-like characters? In the late 1960s, a psychoanalyst named Robert Planck wrote a really fabulous read called The Emotional Significance of Imaginary Beings. And in his preface, he said, the ghosts of old, the angels and devils have paled, but they have been repopulated more substantially than ever with new breeds of, emotion, of imaginary beings. Now, the imaginary beings he was speaking of were space aliens, for the most part. Um, but today, we are creating real humanoids that, we own, that Dr. Planck could only have imagined in the past. Bots and robots that are modeled on ourselves. We're going to need to understand what kind of new, new machine-based personalities we want to interact with and how to interact with such machine-based humanoids. And philosophers, historians, writers, and scientists all have been actively exploring these issues on our behalves. The blueprints for the future will need our best people-centered and things-centered reasoning for us to go through. Thank you very much for attending this afternoon, and thank you for the honor of the Lindbergh Award. Uh, I'm ending with just some photographs of my mentors in psychology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mayer. This was a wonderful talk with a lot of stimulating points. So now I open up to questions, and I'll let you yourself moderate the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm, I should say I'm uh, name impaired. So help me out, please, with your, with your name. Please? Yes. Oh, sorry, I'm Juliana. Juliana, you introduced yourself earlier, I know. And like I said, I'm not good with names. I apologize. Okay. Oh, what? what uh, yes. Oh, uh, uh, you raised your hand, so. I did. Yes. Okay. So my question was, and first of all, I really appreciated your presentation and a lot of the overview slides that had a lot of information. Oh, can people not hear me? Yeah. 
but I just make sure everyone knows. Okay. Sorry. I actually had a question about the earlier slide where you have the arrow from things that you can see. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
these intelligences as a social psychologist. I'm mm -hmm. interested in interaction between intelligences and what situation might enhance certain kinds and not others. Uh, so it, uh, I, I was having a little trouble well, hearing. I said, wait, what's the role of the situation? Of situation. Well, of course, um, different situations. Oh, thank you. Different situations will um, influence how a pre person expresses their reasoning. That is, people will reason differently in different situations. And, um, but I think, yeah, I'll, that's, a, that's a pretty abstract answer. Can you, is, do you want to be more, did I answer it or should I be more specific? I will, I, you know, I think if you're asking, do I acknowledge that situations influence reasoning? Absolutely. Um, if you're asking something more than that, I'm happy to try to. If there's an interaction. Uh, certain situations. Well, sure, there's research that um, if you are, oh, gracious, um, that certain situations can make you anxious and depress your reasoning because you're very anxious. Um, there are other situations where if you are uh, you know, going to the biological for a moment, if you've had a good breakfast and you, and you are well fed and rested and so forth, you will think better. So yes, definitely situations have an impact on that. Yeah, I was thinking, because you're measuring things with what people's Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think personal, you know, uh, sometimes people say to me, well, you know, I'd like to ra raise the uh, uh, personal intelligence of some of the engineers who I'm working with or whatever. And I go, well, why would you, you know, why? What, is it really necessary? I want my engineers to be able to build a bridge that won't fall down. And um, if they're happy with that, that's cool with me. Um, and you know, there are counter answers to that. Well, engineers might work better together if they, if they were higher in these skills. But I don't think that's quite, yeah. So I think they each have their areas of application. Um, yeah, there was one other thing I was just gonna mention along those lines, uh, but maybe I'll come back to it. It's, it's escaped me, so let me hear the next question. And maybe I'll come back to it. So, so a quickie? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You talked about uh, about a fifty percent inheritability from Plowman's work, his estimate. Uh, it, that's a, um, uh, I think that's a meta. Yeah, a meta analysis that right. Plowman is looking at. Yeah. It, and you probably don't have the data on this, but but any sense of whether or not the separate intelligences would have different inheritabilities? Some would be more, so on and so forth. Yeah, most of the research right now is focused on G and understanding, that is general intelligence and understanding where it's coming from. Um, I wouldn't think that there would be difference, that there would be marked differences, but there could be. So I, I just think it's, there's just no, not much research on that. Um, yeah. Concerning your, the, the research you did uh, at West Point, yes, um, I, I was curious if you considered doing this at, for example, a, a complete liberal arts college or a fine arts college and at a, like an engineering school. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And what you expect those results would, would yield. I mean, I'd love to do that and I would love to see whether they yield the same, uh, the same pattern as before. Um, so that, uh, yeah, so uh, if the opportunity presents itself, I would love to do that. Hi, Jack. Um, Hi, Donna. <laughs> um, I know that what your talk is about is your ability model. So you're measuring the ability um, in these different domains. Yeah. But I'm wondering if you've done any research that's looked at um, the use of those abilities, not necessarily always for positive things. Um, so, for example, if you can remember back to being on my dissertation committee all those years ago, and um, I looked at 
bullying behavior in kids who are socially intelligent. And, you know, uh, I found that there were some kids who were really highly socially skilled and they engage in uh, bullying behavior because they have a motivation. They, it gets them what they want. So I'm wondering how all of those um, sort of feeds in a little bit with Ellen, like situational things uh, could be motivation in certain situations where even though you have that ability, you don't, it doesn't necessarily result in positive behavior. Yeah, and thank you. You, you did, uh, Donna, your question uh, elicits two things. One is you reminded me of what I was going to say uh, uh, earlier about uh, Ellen's uh, lines, which is, of course, these tests look at reasoning, not what the person does. So a person may, uh, this, this doesn't quite uh, come back to your, to your question. A person may realize that it would be very, very good to uh, call somebody, to be very so, uh, uh, emotionally intelligent to call somebody up and comfort them. But if they're socially anxious or they just don't care, they're not going to do it. Um, and uh, so that gets a little bit close into what you're, what you're raising. Yeah, I think that there are uh, p people who are quite emotional and emotionally intelligent who use their emotions to manipulate other people. And, um, so I don't view these as anal uh, unalloyed positives, just like uh, there's, you know, sort of a, a subterranean conversation, shall we say, about the fact that there are very, you know, brilliant criminals in the world, uh, and they just tend not to get caught quite so much as, as uh, uh, other criminals because they know exactly the limits of the law and how far they can go and how they can do carry out criminal activities um, and still escape in a courtroom. So, I, you know, your bullies aren't at that, your, your child bullies are not at that level yet, presumably. But um, yeah, they can use it to get to, uh, to get to their own ends if that's what they so choose to do and they don't, you know, and their ethics are of a certain kind, their morals are of a certain kind. Does that answer your question? And Ellen, was that a better answer to your question? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It was a bit of a reprisal um, from the Advanced Seminar last semester. So thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome. Maybe we should just end there. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> You know, uh, just out of curiosity, and I know you're not the uh, biggest uh, admirer of the Big Five, but I still figured I'd ask, just out of curiosity, how do you, do you agree with the findings on the correlations between personal intelligence and the Big Five? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, I do, do you mean, do I accept them as accurate? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So... So the big five, I mean, for people who don't know, those are five commonly found personality traits, extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, stability, openness, closeness, conscientiousness, carelessness, and agreeableness, disagreeableness. Sorry, go ahead. Well, just more specifically, would you think that the relationship between personal intelligence and agreeableness and conscientiousness might have to be a little bit higher than it actually is? in some studies from the past? Well, you've got two things, uh, you've got two things going on. First, you've got uh, self-perception in the, in the big five, which is, which is actually probably pretty accurate for agreeableness, disagreeableness, and conscientiousness, uh, uh, carelessness. But yeah, I think there are other factors that enter in. Uh, it kind of comes back to Ellen's uh, question and Donna's uh, questions of, you know, you can have these abilities, but that doesn't mean you use them. Uh, a number of years ago, there was an article uh, in Esquire magazine about what they referred to as the smartest, you know, one of the smartest people in the world, a young man who had an IQ of something, you know, close to 200 or whatever. Uh, and you, when you read the article, it seemed, seemed quite possible. Um, and he was working as a bouncer in a bar for a variety of reasons. Um, so there's, you know, that's why I love personality psychology. There are all these other parts of personality that interact with intelligences, and some people don't care to develop theirs, and that's okay. Um, you know, it, they may have their reasons. 
So I think you can be conscientious, uh, but not necessarily about uh, you know, expressing, or not necessarily about understanding other people a great deal, although we do see some correlation there. Uh, and uh, you can be emotionally intelligent, but not necessarily agreeable. Yeah, uh, I, just, I just figured I'd uh, ask that because I would have intuitively, without going into any empirical findings, you would think that the more cognizant and aware you are about your own surroundings and those of others, the more naturally inclined you are to um, understand them better as people and your own self. Like, even if you try not to be, uh, how should I say, high in personal intelligence, you just can't help it. you naturally are, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, it does. But you can make a choice and say, you know, I can really, un I really understand other people, and I am going to use that understanding all the time. Uh, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, I have some mission in life, um, and I'm just not going to be that pleasant to other people because my mission is whatever it is is more important. You know, maybe it's saving the environment. Uh, maybe it's uh, 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 making <laughs> engaging in criminal activities. <laughs> you know, whichever it is, you may be really high in personal intelligence, but you may just not care. For, one, for good reasons or for bad reasons. So the ability is one thing, your decision to act on it is an entirely separate, discrete thing. Yeah, I think your decision to act on it is part of a more complex, uh, broader system that we have to take into account. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. That's great. Um, so just going off of that, and this I suppose is more of a, um, a constantly basic repeated question, but to what extent would you say that these emotions can then be learned? So I guess it's almost a nature versus nurture question, but kind of more specific to these ones. Well, emotions, I mean, does the state, you mean emotions or emotional intelligence? I'm sorry, I meant the emotional intelligence. Okay, because emotion. Because emotion is typically the state-centered versus people-centered intelligence as well. Okay. And one might lend itself to being more Okay, so I, I use the following. Uh, actually, let me just go to the emotion case for just one second, which is what's interesting about emotions is those can be modified over time rather substantially. And the uh, heritability of emotions is actually relatively, emotional styles in personality is actually relatively low. Um, so it's quite environmental. Um, but in terms of these intelligences, um, the common answer I give to that, which I give because I believe it, is that we don't have to be geniuses in this area. I am not a genius in, in, uh, in algebra. However, I learned how to do all kinds of wild and crazy algebraic things when I was in high school and I had a great algebra teacher for two years in a row. I could really, you know, whip around all kinds of formula, do matrix algebra and all kinds of stuff that way. And I think it's the same with emotional and personal intelligences. We don't have to be geniuses in these areas. There are experts around who can teach us how to reason in the area uh, with great effectiveness. And uh, so, uh, so it's quite possible to improve one's skills in the area if you want to. But there's not necessarily a need to increase your abilities in every area. In fact, contemporary theories of adult intelligence say that one of the key aspects of adult intelligence is the beginnings of this spe specialization in certain among these broad intelligences and enhancing one's skills until one develops a good deal of expertise in certain areas. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. I think I heard the bells ringing, and yes. I've been a conscientious person, <laughs> conscientiousness. Um, I think we'll bring our Wonderful lecture to a close. I appreciate all the great questions. Obviously, your work, as we know, stimulates lots of fascinating questions. And of course, obviously, in my role as dean, I appreciate the emphasis that the liberal arts and the way we teach and what we teach in the liberal arts, uh, particularly in the humanities. Certainly, we have the hypothesis, at least, that that encourages an and, and immersion in yeah. emotional and personal intelligence yeah. and so and some beginning and some beginning evidence anyway yes so yeah. i think that the beginning emerging evidence 
that I know in psychology and sociology too, we want to see a lot of replication, but I think you've got a headline there for a Chronicle of Higher Ed or New York Times op-ed on why we need the liberal arts because they teach these emotional and personal intelligences that are so well needed. Uh, so, but thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you all for coming this evening. Stop and start. Thank you.